I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I feel fine. How are you? I am fine, too. You know, I saw the funniest thing a little while ago. I saw a man standing on the street corner with a piece of bread and butter in his mouth waiting for the traffic jam. Huh? Oh, 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 that's funny. Imagine a man with bread and butter in his mouth waiting for the traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was that funny, but I'm glad that you think so. <laughs> now read me something else that's funny, the funny. <laughs> All right, I will, but first use that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and at the top of the first page... Snookums, snookums, snookums. And we'll read that right away. So, will everybody please get their funny paper spread out to the first page? I've got mine. And if anyone hasn't got Puck the Comic Weekly with them today, be sure to have your daddy or mommy get it next week so you can follow the comics with us. Now, here we go with Snookums. Magic words by the music, please. Very well, my lady. Diddly-da, diddly-doo, wick a ookums Let's have a little tune for little Snookums. <laughs> Archie comes home. Hooray! I'm home early. Where's Snookums? Rosie tells Archie to be quiet. The Snookums is falling asleep. Archie answers, last picture, top row. Oh, 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 all right, all right. I'll be quiet. But he likes to have me sing him to sleep. So he tiptoes into the nursery. First picture, bottom row. Archie sits down in back of Snookums' crib and starts to sing. rock a baby on the treetop. When the ball breaks. <clears throat> About 15 minutes later, Rosie comes in and asks Archie if he feels all right. Archie replies, Well, sure. I'm singing Snookums to sleep. And Rosie says, last picture, that Snookums is not in there, that he's asleep in the den. And Archie goes... <laughs> He certainly does, and he should, sitting there in an empty room singing to an empty crib. I think Archie's the funniest fellow. Oh, he certainly is. Oh, oh, please, quick, turn over the page to Flash Gordon, because Flash has been captured again by that mean bad man, Zinn. Yes, and Zinn sent Flash into the liquid in chamber to inhale the gas. And anybody uh, who uh, inhales that gas can't think for themselves anymore. Now, you know all about this, don't you? Yes, of course. I listen very carefully. But Flash didn't really breathe the gas because Ruby it gave him a little kind of a thingamajig to put in his nose. Yes, a filter that yes. let him breathe the air without breathing the smoke. And now he's pretending to be, uh, uh, to just uh, uh, be like the man who really breathed the gas. So let's read. Let's see if Flash really fools in. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon. Saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Zinn has told Flash to follow him as he drives off in the car. Flash walks along like a doll that has been wound up. He pretends he has breathed the liquid and atom gas and become one of Zinn's robot slaves. Zinn still can't believe he's Flash's master, so he decides to test his power. And he orders, Flash, fall to the ground. Flash thinks fast, guessing the automatons would obey blindly without trying to protect themselves. It takes all of his willpower to keep from using his hands to break his fall. When Zinn sees Flash fall face downward to the ground, he's sure that Flash has breathed the gas and is now entirely in his power. So last picture, top row, Zinn gloats, Now I can rule Mongo through him, Rubia. Flash, go to the slave barracks till I send for you. First picture, bottom row, in the slave barracks, which is the prison where all of the slaves are kept. 
Flash asks questions of the others, but the zombie-like victims of liquid and gas don't even seem to hear Flash's questions. He's sadly studying these living dead, whom he must imitate when the barracks door opens. It's Rubia who tells Flash to follow her. She leads Flash to her wing of the palace. When they are safely away from anyone that could spy on them, Rubia tells Flash that he can relax now, that they are alone. Flash asks, Why did you save me from the slave gas? Rubia, last picture, puts her arms around Flash and tells him she saved him because she loves him. And again she tells him that Dale is dead and asks Flash if he can't learn to like her. Flash studies her carefully, trying to see what's in her mind because he's learned before that Rubia cannot be trusted. Well, I'm glad that Rubia saved Flash. But even so, I don't like her, because she told Flash that Dale is dead, and Dale is not dead. No, she's not. Rubia's trying to break up Dale and Flash. Well, I hope Flash learns that Dale is alive and and just fixes that Zinn and Rubia and everybody else good. Well, we'll see what's going to happen next week. Okay. Now, let's go across the page to Dick's adventures. Because exciting things are happening. Dick is with Paul Revere in the early days of America. And the British have sent ships to America carrying tea that is very highly taxed. And they're trying to force the Americans to buy the tea. And the Americans don't want to. And so Paul Revere and Dick have a mysterious plan. And I'm anxious to see what's going to happen. Well, maybe we'll find out today. So here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack kazak kazik Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. Three tall-masted ships laden with bales of British tea await unloading at Griffin's War Wharf in Old Boston. The month is December, the year 1773, and the tea is taxed without Yankee consent. So Dick has been invited to join a strange tea party. As Dick and Paul Revere join the party of men dressed like Indians, last picture top roll, Dick is told... Give the password. Dick replies, Saltwater tea. Chief Paul Revere is in charge. At his word, the Indian braves... Dick knows them as clerks, merchants, laborers, lawyers. Press in closer to the ships. First picture, next row. A squad of red coat soldiers is on guard. The men stop, and there are low, whispered instructions. Paul tells Dick, Now, easy, Dick. We want no fighting. Just dump the tea overboard. Dick asks, Only the tea, Mr. Revere? Not the red coats? Paul replies, last picture, middle row. Absolutely not the red coats. Unless in the dark you should happen to mistake them for um, bales of tea. I might make that same mistake myself, lad. At the thought that he can push redcoat soldiers overboard, Dick answers with a grin. Oh, I understand, sir. And then... First picture, last row. Suddenly the Braves attack. Torches flare. They swarm aboard the vessels. In the hour that remains before dawn, three shiploads of British tea are used to flavor the water of Boston Harbor. Dick tries his best not to make mistakes, but when he sees something with legs fall into the water, he asks innocently, Is that another bale of tea, Mr. Revere? And Paul replies with a twinkle in his eye, I believe so, Dick, but I think we should haul him out before he drowns. Dick begins to shout, Man overboard! Man overboard! Last picture, Dick finds himself in bed. His mother and dad are leaning over him, and his mother tells him that he'd been making a lot of noise and asks what's the matter. And Dick replies, Huh? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mom. I was just dreaming about the Boston Tea Party. Gosh, what a party that was. My goodness, Dick has the most exciting dreams. And they're all true. Yes, I know, because my teacher said so. And, and she said to bring Dick's adventures to school so all the kids in my class could read about the Boston Tea Party. I think that's a wonderful idea. What do you think is going to happen next week? I think you'll find Dick with Paul Revere again next week. But to make sure... Oh, I'll be here. Good. And now, look, here's Rusty Riley underneath Dick's adventures. You know, I'm worried. 
worried about Rusty Rowley because that slinky Taffy Allardyce, who's Mr. Miles' nephew, knows that Tex is going to take Big Blaze to the racetrack where he'll be safe. Yes, and now Rusty hears Taffy tell his wife, Goldie, that he'll have to fix Big Blaze tonight. I just hope they don't discover that Rusty has heard them talking. Well, let's read and find out. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty sits quietly in the big chair in front of the fireplace in the Miles' house, hoping that Taffy and Goldie will not see him. He hears Taffy say, Something will have to be done about Big Blaze tonight. If I don't keep him out of that race, Corky will get rough. Goldie tells him they'd better get back and join the party in the next room. Taffy answers, Well, I'll have to find some excuse to slip away and phone Corky. He may have a suggestion. So Goldie tells Taffy to go back to the dining room, that she'll be there in a minute. As Taffy goes off, Goldie looks at the hats and coats that belong to the guests who are at the party and says, I think I saw a man's wallet sticking out of the pocket of one of those coats on the sofa. As she begins to search the pockets, Rusty, who doesn't see this, slips out of the room and down the stairs and says to himself, Suppose I should have stayed in there with those coats and things, but I gotta see Tex or Mr. Miles and tell him what I heard. As Rusty goes downstairs, Goldie, last picture top row, finds the wallet in one of the coat pockets and exclaims, Ah, I thought so. This is my chance to fix that insufferable Rusty, and I mean for good. So she takes the wallet, meaning to use it to get Rusty into trouble, then quietly slips from the room. First picture, bottom row, Rusty is talking to Patty, Mr. Miles' daughter, and he tells her, Patty, I gotta speak to your father. Will you ask him if I can see him? It's awful important. Patty can tell by the expression on Rusty's face that it is important. So she quickly goes to find her father. In a few moments, she's back with her father. Rusty says to him, Gee, Mr. Miles, I had to see you. Mr. and Mrs. Allardyce are planning to do something to Big Blaze. Mr. Miles, who cannot believe that his nephew could be guilty of poisoning a horse, replies impatiently, now, look here, Rusty. You and Tex, too, are imagining things. This is absurd. Oh, please, Mr. Miles, I'm not imagining. That's enough, Rusty. To humor Tex, I'm sending Blaze to the track in the morning. Now, don't let me hear any more about it. And then he turns and walks out of the room. Rusty shakes his head mournfully and leaves the room, saying to himself, Golly, why don't Mr. Miles believe me? Tex has the night off. I'll have to handle this alone. <laughs> A few minutes later, as Patty is going upstairs, she sees Goldie, last picture, going into Rusty's room and behaving in a very suspicious manner. Patty says to herself, What well, jeepers, that's Mrs. Allardyce going into Rusty's room. Now what could she want in there? she's going to do in there. She's going to put that wallet in Rusty's room and make it look like Rusty stole it. How'd you ever guess that? I just knew it. Girls are smart about these things. Well, you certainly are, and I think that's exactly what she'll do. I hope Mr. Miles won't believe that Rusty would steal. Well, maybe next week we'll find out whether or not anything serious happens to Rusty. Oh, she's mean. She's bad, bad, bad. Yes, she is. But now, would you like to read Donald Duck? Oh, yes, please read Donald Duck. So let's turn over to page six. Very well, I will. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly and Donald Duck right on top of page six. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze em, squeeze em, squid a chicka chack. Let's have music to pin a quack quack. Donald has decided to improve his garden, so he decides that he needs some more good dirt. And he says to his nephew, Huey, Now to get some good top soil. So off they go with a wheelbarrow to get some good dirt. Huey asks, Are you going to that vacant lot over on Elm Street? Donald replies, Nope. I'm smart. I'm going to the one up on Hill Street. And Huey answered, Oh, 
yeah, I get it. Downhill all the way back. Donald nods. So up the hill they go with the empty wheelbarrow so that when he comes down the hill with a full wheelbarrow, the wheelbarrow will just roll by itself and Donald won't have to do any work. Last picture, top row. Donald has piled the dirt high on the wheelbarrow. And Huey says, My, that's an awful big load. And Donald replies, Why not? I'll have old man gravity working for me on the return trip. And then he starts down the hill for home. The load is so heavy that the wheelbarrow starts to roll rather fast. And Huey yells, first picture, bottom row. Hey, don't go so fast. But the wheelbarrow goes even faster. And Huey yells, Hey, wait up. Donald, who can't hold the heavy load back, answers, I can't. I'll meet you at home. Faster and faster, down the hill, the wheelbarrow goes. They come to a turn, and Huey yells, Hey, we turn here. Donald yells, I can't. And over the curb it goes. Bumps across the street through a fence. All of a sudden, Huey yells, Uncle Donald, let go. And there's a big splash. On last picture, Donald and Huey look at the wheelbarrow, which is in the river. And Donald feels just like this. <laughs> oh, poor oh. Donald. It's too bad that happened, but I just can't help but laugh. It was so funny. Yes, maybe <laughs> next time Donald won't try to take such a heavy load. <laughs> yes, and maybe then he'll be able to get home with the way he starts out with. Yes. Oh, look, underneath Donald Duck, there's Roy Rogers, my favorite cowboy. This is exciting. Oh, you bet it is, because Roy has discovered the old hermit who has been setting fire to the telegraph poles. The man is in a cave, and he shot at Roy, but he missed him. And now he's waiting to take another shot at Roy, and this time he doesn't intend to miss. Well, please read quick. I want to see what happens. Very well. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. hi yip hi -oh. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi -oh. <laughs> The old hermit watches the rock that Roy ducked behind. But what the hermit doesn't know is that Roy has backtracked and slipped around and come up on the rock above the cave. As Roy gets on the rock above, he hears the hermit mutter, Yeah, come out from behind that rock, you sneaking telegraph spy. I won't miss again. Quick as a flash, Roy flips his rope. And in a second, the hermit finds his arms pinned to his waist. He yells, Hey, what? Looks up to see Roy holding the rope tight. Roy says, Sorry, Pop. But you and that blunderbuss are plumb dangerous. Quickly, Roy scrambles down and has the old hermit tied up so he can do no more harm. Then Roy says cheerfully, You want to tell me how you've been starting these fires in the telegraph line, Pop? The hermit replies, Yeah, you can see for yourself. Look in the cave. Roy goes into the cave. He finds a strange-looking machine covered with a big tarpaulin. That's a piece of canvas. And the hermit says, Don't hurt it, mister. I spent years a-building that. She's almost finished, Roy asks. Almost? Hey, what is it anyway? Last picture, top row. The hermit goes to his old mule, Betsy, as he answers. I'll show you how it works. <laughs> I'm right proud of it. Come on, Betsy. He leads Betsy outside. The mule pulls the strange contraption out of the cave. Roy says, All right, that's far enough, Pop. No tricks now. The hermit answers, Yeah, all right. Just pull the tarp off her. So Roy pulls off the tarpaulin, which covers the contraption, and underneath finds a piece of glass ten feet high and two feet thick. Roy exclaims, Hey, a big glass lens. How in thunder does it work? The hermit starts to unhitch the mule from the contraption, saying, yeah, I can't show you now, son. Valley's too wet from rain to catch fire. Roy, looking at the glass, says, Ah, I'm beginning to get the general idea. Suddenly, the hermit exclaims, Hey, you're free, Betsy. Go get him. Kick him into the middle of next week. The room, the mule runs at Roy, last picture. And Roy hears Brad shout, Hey, Roy, duck! Roy looks up to see the hind feet of the mule coming toward his head. Oh, my. I hope that mule doesn't really kick Roy. I hope not. But next week, we'll find out for sure. Oh. Oh, oh, now could we read the Dagwood and Blondie? We certainly can, if you'll pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. Here it is. Spread out this fun. Very well, here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure music for Dagwood and Blondie. 
Blondie is crying. <laughs> Alexander asks Cookie, hey, why is Mama crying? Cookie tells him it's because Dagwood wouldn't let her buy the plaid coat she saw in Hinkle's window. <laughs> Cookie looks at her mother and says, Sad, isn't it? And Alexander feels so sad, he says, hey, Let's speak to Pop about it. But when they talk to Dagwood, he folds his arms firmly, last picture top row, frowns ferociously and says, No! And when I say no, I mean it. She can't have the coat. Cookie and Alexander leave the room, and Alexander says, first picture, next row. Gee, I've never seen Pop so hard-hearted. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dagwood looks out the window. He has a stern expression on his face, and he says to himself proudly, I can be a man of steel when I want to. I can be cruel and cold with a heart of rock when it's necessary. <laughs> Then Blondie has a scheme. She bustles around in the kitchen and says, I'll cook all his favorite dishes for supper. That always wins him over. So she happily cooks Dagwood's favorite supper, hoping that he'll be so happy about it that he'll buy her the coat. But as he finishes supper, first picture, next row, Dagwood pounds the table fiercely and roars, It's a delicious supper! But no coat. Understand? No coat. Dagwood frowns fiercely. And Blondie bursts into tears again. <laughs> and Dagwood suddenly looks very sorry. And he goes out of the room and comes back, last picture of the row, with a box and hands it to Blondie, saying, Stop crying, dear. Here's your coat. I bought it for you yesterday. Blondie exclaims, well, then why did you tell me I couldn't have it? Dagwood answers, first picture bottom row. I was practicing being firm. I knew you wanted the hat that was in the window, too, and, well, I wanted to be firm about it. Blondie says. Oh, darling, you don't have to worry about that. I bought the hat this morning. Hmm? And she puts on the hat and coat. <laughs> and says to Dagwood, last picture. You're the sweetest, kindest man in the world. Dagwood takes one look at the hat he didn't want her to buy, and then a look at the coat which he had to spend so much money for, and he chews his fingernails and moans. Oh, husbands are a sorry lot. <laughs> oh, poor Dagwood. He never wins. I should say not. Not with Blondie. He bought her the coat to be nice to her so he could be firm about not letting her buy the hat, and then she got both of them anyway. Well, it's a very nice hat. Um, should we read Prince Valiant? Yes, yes, please. Very well, then. Turn to page four of the second section. And here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Hap Atlas swore on his father's deathbed that he would take and rule the land of Thule, whose ruler is King Aguar, father of Prince Valiant. But when King Hap Atla attacked the castle of King Aguar, his well-laid plans come to nothing before a seemingly empty castle that defies capture. And the army he should have surprised and have defeated in battle is behind him in his own country, raiding his own kingdom. And he decides it's time to make peace. So King Aguar and King Hap Atla have met to see if they can come to sensible peace terms. And then Alita makes friends with Hap Atla's queen and leads her into their castle. With great gallantry, Hap Atla leaves the peace conference and enters the castle in search of his wife. In Alita's apartment, he finds her trying on gowns. His brave gesture ends in a wave of confusion and embarrassment. The women are very annoyed to find a man marching into their room when they are trying on dresses. And even the most patient and dutiful of queens can lose her temper. 
First picture next row, Half Atla gets a good scolding from his wife. And she ends by saying, I'm staying here until you settle your old war and have my baby sent into me. Already he has the sniffles from sleeping in a drafty tent. As he backs away, Alita tells him that he can't take this fortress, that the warriors of Thule are behind him, and that he'll have to pay for every bit of damage his nonsense has caused, and that he'll keep his army here until King Agwa's men are returned to their homes, and that there's to be no more fighting. And then she orders him to tell King Agwa that dinner will be served in an hour. Hap Atlas strode into the castle, a warrior king. He comes out like a small boy caught in some mischief. First picture, bottom row. As he drops to his camp stool, very sadly, King Agwar smiles, knowing that Hap Atla must have had a good scolding from Alita. And he says sympathetically, I know just how you feel. She's been running my kingdom ever since she came here. And then he takes him by the arm, last picture, and says, Ah, but come, sir. We must not keep dinner waiting. Even kings can get a scolding, as you now know. Well, he deserved a good scolding, and he'd better listen to Alita if he doesn't want to get into more trouble. Now, he'd better, and if he listens to her, maybe there'll be peace and quiet in the kingdom, and there'll be no more killing. Well, I hope so. Well, that's all the time I have, but I'll be sure to see you next week at the same time. Well, I will be here. Good. Now, before I go, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.